Day after day, I am more surprised about how many people are struggling with thyroid issues. What if the answers were a little more simple than we're letting on to be? Stay tuned to today's episode to find out more. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. This is the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. And today I'm talking with my friend, Carrie Bennett, and we are talking all about quantum biology and circadian biology and how it relates to your thyroid health. Now, I talk with people on a daily basis, and I know Carrie does as well as a practitioner, of people who struggle with thyroid issues. And the typical route is to continue doing blood work, continue adding more medications, continue adding more supplements. And I see people getting some relief from those methods. But then I also see a lot of people not getting relief from those methods who feel really no difference adding in those medications and supplements. And obviously this podcast, this information is for informational purposes only. It is not medical advice. But I think we have some really interesting points when it comes to how you can actually improve your thyroid and your hormonal balance, which can actually lead to more optimized hormones, weight loss, fertility, all of these things that people are seeking and spending a lot of money with functional practitioners and getting testing and not necessarily getting the results that they're looking for. So I hope you enjoy this chat with Carrie and I today. If you're watching this on the day that I've released it, we are actually holding a Zoom informational session. If you are someone who's on a fertility or a hormone balancing journey and would like to learn more about what Carrie and I can offer in the framework of a course that's going to be held on Monday, January 16th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, there's going to be a link down in the information section if you want to join us for that Zoom meeting to find out more about the offerings that Carrie and I have in regards to thyroid and hormone balance that don't involve thousands of dollars of testing or even necessarily supplements. So again, this is not medical advice, but hopefully some of this information is helpful to you. And thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. I will talk with you again soon. Hello everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the live stream. I'm going to wait for my friend Carrie to join us, but before she comes on, I just want to do a quick little reminder that nothing we talk about is medical advice, nor is it a uh, replacement for working with someone <laughs> on these issues, but we just really want to talk about some some different ideas when it comes to thyroid disorders and looking at these things kind of through a different point of view that we look at in even in the in the range of like functional medicine. So allopathic medicine has one way of looking at the thyroid and then functional medicine looks at it a little differently. The way that Carrie and I are going to talk about today is even more different. So Again, um, yeah, it says nobody wants medical advice, just the truth. Yes, I understand that for sure. There's Miss Carrie. Disclaimers out there so that people understand we are not trying to do that. It's trying to accept her. There she is. Yay. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good, Sarah. How are you? You know, I do. <laughs> I, do. I totally do. <laughs> yes. Well, also, I'm so glad you're here and I'm so excited to talk about this. Um, I did a post the other day just kind of talking about hormone imbalances and how we look at those. And, you know, you can't really talk about hormones without talking about thyroid, would you say? 100%. Percent right. It kind of it really runs a lot of the show, and it's highly tied to mitochondrial health and circadian rhythm. And yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting how uh, once you start to connect the dots, the voltage, what I call exclusions on water or charge, it's also very much tied to that inside of the cells. So it's really hard to isolate any of these systems and say, oh, it's my estrogen oh, it's my thyroid and just one specific number. It's like, no, they all work together. And I, we, I really want people to understand how they all work together. And you can do things from our perspective to really support the entire balance, the entire system. 
Right. And what we're what we're talking about is definitely not a replacement for what someone is doing right now, right off the bat. Right. We, we want right. to be clear about that. Um, but I think that eventually a lot of the things that we talk about could be really supportive and could help people transition away from a, a, a a response where they're doing a lot of medications and supplements and things like that. Um, so definitely not a replacement for that right now, yep. immediately off the, off the bat, but something that could be very supportive in helping someone transition off eventually. Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it, I think, I think what I'd love to start with Sarah is this recognition that I don't know if anyone's dove down this, dove down this rabbit hole. I know I did for my own health about, gosh, 11 years now. And I, it was when I first came across this term of the HPA oh, axis, yes. right? <laughs> you know, so like all of a sudden we get these hormone imbalances or low energy or, or something's happening with that. And we come across that, that, that term and that stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So that means that there's a direct connection between my hypothalamus and pituitary glands, which are in my brain and my adrenals, which sit near my kidneys, right? My adrenal glands. There's also a, a other axes though too, right? There's a hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis. There's a hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, right? When you dive down these as separate rabbit holes, you're like, oh, okay, there's something wrong with my ovaries or there's something wrong with my thyroid or there's something wrong with my adrenal glands. And I find it's way more effective to look at things upstream to first, to ask yourself, is my hypothalamus receiving the signals that it needs in order to kind of run those pathways, run those shows appropriately? And so um, that actually starts with my eyes. It's what we talk about all the time. There's a direct connection between my eyes and my hypothalamus called the retinohypothalamic tract, which means that the light signals that enter my eyes are going to basically tell my hypothalamus some key information about what it needs to signal. Does it need to signal that there's ener that energy production needs to increase because it's the start of the day and we need to rev up certain pathways? Um, does it need to signal m more thyroid hormone production for that exact same reason? So it all really starts with that. And if we're looking at anything downstream of that, um, and that actually, those numbers never get tested. And I don't no. even, I don't even trust blood work. I feel like, I feel like we've said this before. There's a whole resonance effect when it comes to these hormones and things. Um, but th those numbers are actually never tested in blood work, even, even there. So like, for example, my hypothalamus would communicate to my pituitary gland with thyroid releasing hormone. That's TRH. There is not one panel that you've ever had run on your thyroid health that ha contains TRH, right? It's not. Right. So, so no one even takes that into consideration. Is the hypothalamus receiving the signals that it needs in order to make this whole pathway kind of get kicked off? off and, and started and, 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 and synced up with the time of day that you're currently experiencing. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of those things, like when you and I talk about going outside in the morning and sort of setting your circadian rhythm, and you know, I've got my glasses here. I'm not wearing them because my window is open and my phone screen is red, so I always like to throw that out there for people who are like, why aren't you wearing your blue bloggers? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the light signal that our eyes are getting in the morning is absolutely crucial to our energy management system of the body. And I think the thyroid, that is what helps to manage a lot of our energy in the body, would you say? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. It's really, it really controls what's happening metabolically in the mitochondria. So thyroid hormones will influence two, three key things inside of the cells. Thyroid hormones will influence the activity in the mitochondria. So that would mean things like ATP production. And whenever these, a lot of the research is always around ATP production in the mitochondria, because the assumption is that ATP runs the show. I'm of the opinion, and I know all of my quantum biology friends are of the opinion that it plays a role, but it's the water inside of the, the yeah. cell that runs the show, right? It's that water that structures itself into a battery of energy that really, really provides what the cell needs to, to have enough energy and flow. Um, and so the thyroid hormone plays a role in that. Thyroid hormone can dictate how many mitochondria you have in a given cell. So do we need to increase mitochondrial content or decrease it based on your demands, your body's specific demands? And so in that way, mitochondria really are in charge also of then voltage inside of the cell. The, th the thyroid will communicate to the mitochondria to make the water charges up my cell, 
that determines things like oxygen entering the cell and other nutrients entering the cell. So it's all connected. The other thing the mitochondria do, right, when, when, they get, when they get these communication pathways, in the morning, the mitochondria are responsible for making pregnenolone, which is a, a main steroid hormone. So if you ever Google steroid hormone cascade, you'll see pregnenolone at the top okay. almost. Cord, uh, sorry, cholesterol is at the way, way top, right? And then you'll see pregnenolone. Pregnenolone can become all these other different steroid hormones. So testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, cortisol. And so there's a direct relationship between then cortisol and thyroid. When cortisol levels are optimized, which we should get this beautiful surge of cortisol in the morning when the brightness of the light yes. and the intensity and the vibrancy of the light enters our eyes in the morning, we're meant to get this cortisol surge. Um, and that's a healthy thing because that cortisol then ties to certain pathways of, of producing, making sure our blood sugar is the right, right levels and mm -hmm. other, other energetic cascades that happen with that. And so, but when we don't get that and instead we get weird cortisol surges at other times, like how you talk a lot about coffee on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, yep. because we go from um, zero essentially at, yep. in the middle of the night, flipping on the lights in our house, yep. or, we, or we don't get a high enough surge because we never experience the brightness of the light that we yep. need. Because yes. living indoors, while it seems bright, it's 10 to a thousand times brighter outside, even on a cloudy, cloudy day. day. And so, yeah. right, we go from indoors right to the office. So you can see how cortisol levels can kind of get dysregulated. And when there's dysregulated cortisol, that can also then change our thyroid hormone activity too. And it can change how our mitochondria perceive our, our health versus our threat status, you know, and kind of dictate other hormonal cascades there. So it's really cool to see how these all work together. And they're all in constant communication with each other for, for our betterment. Thyroids don't, thyroid, like a gland doesn't just go kaput, right. right? I was under the impression when I had a severe, I had di diagnosed, right? Severe adrenal fatigue. Yep. That doesn't mean that my adrenal glands just all of a sudden, you know, kicked it to the curb. Right. No, as soon as I started getting morning light, oh, believe it or not, my, my, like all of my adrenal hormones all of a sudden perked right back up. It wasn't because my adrenal glands were fatigued. It's because I was getting the wrong signals to them. So they couldn't adapt and adjust the way I was asked, I needed them to do for my body. So it's an interesting thing. The, the body adapts with these numbers that we see on blood panels or salivary panels or urine panels. Those numbers, if they're out of range, isn't because there's something broken with the actual organ or gland. It's because we're not providing it with the key signals that it needs to, to optimize and go back to what we want it to do. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's all about the signal that those glands are getting in particular. And, you know, I think a lot of people think this is too simple to be true. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's what I get a lot is like, no, and that's that's where I was before I jumped into all of this stuff. When I was on my fertility journey, I was trying to get pregnant, my thyroid was low. I had low T3 and I was I tried to take the synthetic T3 and all that did was give me anxiety and insomnia. It did not help me one bit. So I had to go off of that. Again, this is not medical advice for anyone. But when I began to understand this morning light signal and actually practice that on a consistent basis, getting sunrise into my eyes, getting UVA into my eyes, doing that and getting sunlight exposure on my skin to help to expand that easy water to give my body that correct energy signal. Uh, those numbers on a blood panel eventually went into a normal range and I didn't take any specific supplements. I didn't do anything for that. It was this signal. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you work from home, so that's good for you, but I have to go to an office. And you and I both have worked with a lot of people that have office jobs that that's have true. busy lives and they can still do this. It's just a matter of kind of, you know, staging your morning of I'm going to take a, you know, a two to five minute break at this point, at this point. So it's, it's about being strategic. You don't have to spend hours and hours mm -hmm. in sunlight. But, you know, it's, it's just about being strategic, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's about being strategic. Like, so 
I tell people if you're off, if, if in your work you see people taking smoke breaks, then you can take a light break. And now there is t sometimes restrictions around that. You know, yes. when I work with factory workers who have just like, okay, I've got a 15 minute, one 15 minute break during my shift and a 30 minute lunch. Well, guess what? You just got to take those outside. Yeah. You just, it doesn't matter what time of day, you just have to take those outside. Or if I'm working with teachers who, yeah, uh, it's I like a okay, lot of teachers, a lot of teachers. You know, can't do you have the capacity to ever just crack yeah. open a window in your classroom and just during your grade, like when you're doing grading or when you're doing some other when when you don't or not interacting with students or the weather's nice and you're able to open windows, open your windows, turn off your overhead lights. And what a lot of teachers report back to me is that actually the behavior of their students and the concentration and focus of students is better uh, when those when those horrible fluorescent lights are off too. Yeah. But that being said, yeah, it, 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 it you know it's it's it there's always an excuse, you know. Yeah. I mean, like I could use the excuse of a mom of three always driving right. kids here and there. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, oh, dirty house laundry that I need to take care of. There's always an excuse. So we have to recognize what's our priority. And so what I started telling myself when I, when I wasn't implementing things that I knew were beneficial to me, I had to mentally shift it and make my brain say, feeling, feeling better with morning sunlight is not a priority to me. Like, that's what you say when you make an excuse. That's kind right. of another way. And it's like, that doesn't resonate with me. Right. That doesn't say, well, it is a priority to me. Right. So I'm going to make it a priority and I'm going to do those little things I need to do. And what happens when you get consistent with it, you need less, right? Because your body knows and it gets synced up and it's kind of in this rhythm and it's rolling. And so maybe one day you only get literally a 30 second glance out right. of a, out of a window. That's okay. Because there's other days where you did a 30 minute walk right. at that time slot. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think we live in, in die too much by numbers on labs and not enough on how we actually feel. You know, um, I think some people can have great numbers on labs, but then they feel terrible, right? They absolutely yeah. feel terrible. And yeah. someone's asking about uh, sunscreen and, you know, you and I were talking back and forth. There was a, a popular influencer that she's kind of struggling with infertility and she was doing a reel and wearing sunglasses. Um, so maybe we can kind of cover sunglasses and sunscreen in regards to thyroid and hormones, how, how that kind of plays into things. Yeah, let's do that right now because that's key, right? There's, there are certain receptors for light that are not, they're called non-visual pathways. What that means is like, there's like little sensors in my eyes and on my skin mm -hmm. that, that sense all the light and the colors of the light that have nothing to do with me actually having to see a thing. And those sensors are per picking up the light in my environment constantly and conveying a message to my body, something about it. Sometimes it's hella confusing. Like when I had to be in a hospital visiting family mm -hmm. members for an extended period of time, it's, it's, a, it's hard, right? Yeah. It's hard, no joke. Um, but then sometimes it's really clear. Okay, I was just in two hours of playground supervision. I think Sarah knows by now, Fridays I do playground supervision at the school. <laughs> and so I'm, there I was outside for two hours and I was syncing up what skin I had exposed because it's, you know, cold here. Oh, I'm, in Michigan. What, I'm in Michigan. What skin I had exposed, I was syncing it up to, to the light in my eyes. I, would, I won't wear sunglasses mm -hmm. anymore because the sensors in my eyes need to, and the sensors in my skin need to match. Yeah. And when they perceive the same things, they can do various things, right? They can maintain my circadian rhythm, yes, circadian mental health is on point, right? Those melanopsin receptors. Mm -hmm. Well, they will. They'll communicate to the clock in my brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus to tell me the time of day. That'll sync up. When my brain knows the time of day, it knows what hormones to produce. Yeah. It knows what... Uh, what hormones not to it no the, the pituitary gland or i'm sorry the pineal gland which is more active at night knows to shut down yeah. and be suppressed this is not your time and so when you wear sunglasses which are really dark or when you wear sunscreen and you cover this those melanopsin receptors on your skin and the neuropsin and all there's other there's other receptors as well that sense different colors of light when you block those, you send a confusing signal. You send a chaotic signal. And when you send a chaotic signal, 
what, what happens if you are just picture your most chaotic situation in life right. when i'm in a chaotic situation in life i'm in like fight or flight mode right, right. like i'm this I'm anxious i something just i feel i feel on edge uh something just feels wrong imagine the body feeling that way simply because it's not getting the time of day synced up appropriately with what your environment is giving you and at the cellular level we call chaos inflammation and whenever there's inflammation there's a whole host of things like mitochondrial dysfunction and other things like that that will uh run the show and that's not what we want to have happen right. and i mean there's a difference because someone wants to know if you wear a large hat is it going to be the same as wearing sunglasses and no i wear a hat in the summer absolutely I'm not an idiot. You wear a visor, don't you wear yeah, a visor? Yeah, I have a visor because I want the sun to hit the top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> I have like, my husband's like, what are you like, some weird, like, a tennis, a tennis player? A tennis player? See, like, he has like all these funny nicknames for me when I wear my visor because it does look really dorky, but I don't care because it's part of the way that I practice safe sun exposure. I don't lay out in the sun for six hours a day. I build up a solar callus, I get sunrise in my eyes, I get UVA light, because like you said, when your body gets those correct signals, it's going to create hormones to prepare your body for sunlight exposure to receive that UVB light. So you don't get completely charred, you know, but you exactly. still don't want to be out there for hours. You go back inside, you know, after you've reached your max, you're not, you're not trying to be stupid about it. But yeah, the, the that, body always has this. I'm sorry, Sarah, for interrupting, but the skin has a signal. It's called a pinkening, yeah. right? Literally a little histamine release in the skin that sometimes we feel synonymous. We, we would call it a sunburn, but that's not a sunburn, right? That's a uh, just a response to say, okay, Carrie has sunned herself enough. Now she can go out of the sun and she can get into the shade. She can put a long sleeve shirt on. Um, but basically I've received it. And if we're in tune with that and we allow the signaling between the eyes and the skin to allow that to happen in a healthy way, then it's all going to match. It's all going to match. I haven't burned. Listen, mm -hmm. I used to be that lady at the beach Me that too. thrived, right? <laughs> And I haven't burned in darn near close to a decade that I've been doing this, right? Like I don't even, right. I can't even imagine, the, remember the last time I did. Um, and so it's it's cool when you actually recognize when my eyes perceive certain light signals, like my eyes will be like, oh, there's elevated UV. There's a lot more UV. It's gonna make UV filters in my skin. One's called urocanic acid. And then once I've kind of saturated my, and it's like enough, that's gonna start to make the histamine, the pinkening. So it's really cool to see that if I kind of sync it all together, my body works for me with the sunlight instead of against me. Right. And that, and just kind of going back to our whole conversation, the whole topic about thyroid and hormone balance, it's important for us to get these signals in sequential order and get them so that these, you know, clocks inside of our body can sync up and we make the right amount of thyroid hormone, we make the right amount of sex hormone. So when someone has a thyroid issue or a hormonal imbalance, the first thing you want them to do is this type of thing, right? A hundred percent. You have to set, you have to work with a circadian rhythm, right? You have to, um, you have to give key light signals and you have to then block the artificial light at night because these pathways need to know when to sync up, right? They, right. And uh, amongst all other things too, when your circadian rhythm is intact, right? And there are people, listen, I've worked with so many people with chronic illness. And so I say, never let perfect be the enemy right. of good, Please. right? The number of people who I've had who can't get out of bed before 11 a.m., okay, right? As soon as you get up, open a window, right? And look outside, start to get the light signals, and then you start to shift your day. But yeah, the body needs to know the time of day to sync up all of these pathways. And then also you need to have know when it's nighttime. So you have right. to block the artificial light at night. So that's when the pineal gland can start to take over and do its thing at night. And those opposing, it's kind of opposing, right? You have like more pituitary function during the day, more pineal function at night. And those two things could need to work in that way. And when they do, you start to get see these pathways get balanced. You see, start to see the mitochondria become healthier. And all of that plays a role in overall hormone balance, but including thyroid thyroid health um because that really does help to kind of run the show with a lot of things exactly yeah so i think that that's something that people should really take a look at before they go down the route of taking a ton of supplements and you know doing all these other things and, and don't let perfect be the enemy of good that's what i really really love 
to really reiterate with people, get sunlight when you can, as much as you can. If you only have five minutes, take the five minutes. If you have 15, 20, 30 minutes, take that, right? It's what you always say, it's a quantum effect. So just a little bit is going to be a large effect, right? Yeah, yeah, small stimuli, when, especially when applied consistently, are right. what we need to kind of keep our body all in sync and all on, and on, and on track. Um, do you know, I was just, so, I, the, the school that I work at, you know, th these other playground supervisor parents, they kind of, they kind of know me. <laughs> and one of the dads was just like, you know, stay warm on days like this. I've, I've, I've seen these Bluetooth things, you know, that you can, these Bluetooth heaters. And he looked at me, he's just like, you wouldn't approve. No. And she, I was like, no. Oh. no, 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 I wouldn't. Because there's also a huge now connection between thyroid health and Bluetooth and EMFs, really? right? Um, because the gland is so superficial, yes. because we're so That's likely to put things like, you know, I've seen people with those headphones that just their headphones just around their neck, you know, um, things like that. Those actually have been shown to be pretty darn impactful to thyroid health. Wow. So again, we talked a lot about non-native EMFs and recognizing that those frequencies, those chaotic frequencies will change the, the way glands respond. Right. Um, whether, they, whether they perceive it as a stressor, so they won't allow enough T3, um, whether they just act, they actually can deplete minerals as well. Yeah. They can deplete the charge in our bodies. So there's a lot of things that we talk about that I think regardless of what you are currently doing, it will only enhance your results. Um, even if you do, even if you do believe in supplements or, or your doctor right. has you on a medication, right? We're not going to touch that, but we're going to mm -hmm. let you know that these things we believe are foundational. And then once you have your foundation set and you see how your body responds to these things, then you can decide, do I need all these supplements? Or, you know, I've had a lot of clients, they ask their doctor to, to lower their thyroid or go off their medications be because of this. So it's just interesting to, to know that when you have a foundation of circadian biology and quantum health, um, things just really seem to flow better, work better. Yeah, I mean, I had a, a, a client just last month that she's a school teacher and she has to be in the building and she has to ha do a lot of weird hacks, you know, to get sunlight. But she's been doing it, just these little quantum hits of sunlight. And she actually just got off of her thyroid medication from just doing these circadian hacks. And that may not be the case for everyone. Again, work with a medical professional but I've seen it happen more often than not. I just had someone complete my 21 day program that their antibodies, their thyroid antibodies for Hashimoto's went from like over 1200 down to under a hundred. I mean, it's, it's a really possible thing. And I didn't tell her to add anything, you know, no supplements. It was just like, let's understand light. Let's block artificial light at night, get sunlight at these key times throughout the day. And boom, her body body was just like, oh, okay, because I think that the glands in her body, like you, like you're saying in the very beginning, we have basically clocks all on the inside of our body. Like, I love that illustration of that entire body, like covered in clocks. That's mm -hmm. how circadian rhythms work. You know, you have to get that correct signal to time up with that clock in your body so that these glands and organs can work properly as they are supposed to. But we're constantly like turning on overhead light or wearing sunglasses or staying indoors all day. And I see people walking from their home to their car with sunglasses on, or maybe they're taking a morning walk with sunglasses on. And I'm like, you know, so the number of people I want to stop on my morning walk and be like, just, just, just put them on your head. Just put them on the top of your head. <laughs> it's like an overcast day. I see people wearing I sunglasses. And I used to be the same way. Like my eyes Dang. were super sensitive yep. and cause I'm, you know, I have really light eyes. And so mm -hmm. I would always wear the sunglasses, even on a cloudy overcast day. But the more mm -hmm. you expose yourself to sunrise and sunset that really healing red light the less sensitive you can become to sun and you, you know and i don't tell people to look directly at it you just kind of glance in the general direction of it you do want to try to do no glasses or contacts i think that's helpful um there's a question about light boxes in here i'd love to hear <laughs> You know, my take on light boxes, I used to use one, right? I'm in like the capital of seasonal affective disorder here up in <laughs> West Michigan. Um, so I used to use one, right? Because what, what does a light box provide? A, a brightness and a big hit of blue light. Yeah. What do we get when we go outside at sunrise or near sunrise in the morning, the morning window of time? brightness and a big hit of blue and so um what we're missing when we get when we're just with a light box that that doesn't necessarily 
let's just say it's a Band-Aid, right? It, it, could it be beneficial? It could. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't give you the all the other colors of the rainbow that the sun is emitting. And while I like to think that I'm fairly knowledgeable about sunlight and the frequencies and what they do, what we know about the sun is the tip of the iceberg. Right. We know probably 1% of all of the things that those light frequencies do for us. So for me to say I'm just going to isolate certain frequencies and assume that it's it's the same or it's okay, that's kind of short-sighted. And you're also not going to get the change that mm -hmm. happens. So mm -hmm. while blue, blue light never stays the same, it is the one light color that really varies predictably mm -hmm. that we tune into from sunrise till solar noon to sunset. And it's, it's variation is what sets our circadian clock. So those melanopsin uh, receptors, those blue light receptors in our eyes and on our skin are continually picking up more and 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 more blue light and less and less and less and less and less and less. And it's how we tell time. That yeah. is time in our body. It's the amount of blue light that's in our environment. And when blue light's gone, which, which should be after sunset, that's when it starts to, we're in, going into a whole nother phase. We're going to go into our regenerative states of that happen in darkness while we sleep. Right. So if you are looking at your phone, that's a ridiculously huge source of blue light that never changes. Again, fluorescent lights, overhead lights in your home, that's a huge source of blue light that never changes. And so what kind of signal are you sending to your body, to those organs, to, you know, when you're constantly exposing yourself to that bright blue light, when it's supposed to, when we go outside, shift and change throughout the day, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're, we're what, what I see with blue light at night is we're giving our body, especially our especially our steroid or our sex hormones, we're giving them a continuous on signal they should be shutting down. So what happens in the morning with that blue light frequency, sunrise-ish time, right? We're getting our hypothalamus to tell our mitochondria basically to make these hormones, these hormones get produced. Um, and then, believe it or not, UV light is a signal that we, we can use to start to break down these hormones and start to balance these hormones out. So what happens at night when all of a sudden I'm just getting this blue signal of more hormones, more hormones, more hormones, and never this off switch? Right. It's why there's a massive connection between artificial light at night and hormone-based cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, and also not to mention the fact that that artificial light at night really tanks the hormone of darkness, melatonin. When the melatonin that yeah. we use at night to help to clear out and cancerous cells and get rid of all, all of that via a process called apoptosis. So you can kind of see how light drives can drive, can drive hormone balance or it can drive hormone imbalance when it's applied with the way that we, that modern humans live. Right. right. And then someone says, you know, that they're blue blockers, the instructions say to never wear those during the day. <laughs> um, do you think they should wear the blue blockers while looking at the phone or the computer? It depends on... Story. It depends on your level of mitigation, you know, in terms of like, like you said, do, when I, if I have a client with Iris Tech software, then no, I, whatever you want to do. What happens, here's the key. And this is, this is why I have found that I like the, the Viva Rays brand yeah. the best. But this is, this, is, this is the key here, is that we do need blue light into our yeah. eyes during the day. Yeah. Blue, blue light gets a bad rep. I feel like I, I think I got a post that starts just like that back in the day. Blue light has a bad rep yeah. because we assume that it's bad all the time. Right. And while we shouldn't necessarily, it's not necessarily great for our eyes and the, the needing to kind of regenerate photoreceptors in our eyes. It's not great to stare at artificial blue light all day right. long. But when we wear orange tone blue blockers during the day, it's going to start to tell our brain that it's nighttime That's because said, those yeah. block all the blue light, right? So we're yeah. going to feel fatigued. It's why they made the switch in offices from incandescent bulbs to like these LEDs and these compact mm -hmm. fluorescents because they realized that a shot of blue, a big shot of blue uh, in the day would keep their uh, employees more alert. Um, but it's like, we don't need it that way, right? No. Just get it from the sun. Go out and get your right. little sun hits. But yeah, that's why I would not, I wouldn't say wear the orange tone during the day. No, no I wouldn't not. do that. Or red, definitely not. not or red the red, the definitely not the red. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even, the, even the dark yellow, yeah. I think can cause fatigue. So that's where yeah. you have to kind of play around with it and know yeah. what works best for you. I take mine on and off. Like I have the Viva Rays and these are uh, raw optics and I, mm -hmm. I will take mine on and off. And I think the most important thing is, is that you're, 
taking light breaks to go outside to inform your body of what time it actually is because that yeah. signal from the sun the signal from just going outdoors even on a cloudy like today it's cloudy it's gloomy it's cold but i've been going outside as often as i can five minutes here two minutes here if they're just as often as i can to let my body know hey it's two o'clock it's friday it's january the 13th right like that's the that's the point and what happens you know this whole term circadian mismatch what happens is that when we have circadian mismatch we create inflammation in the body right because yeah. Yeah. we're going against what we're supposed to be doing time of day time of year and that creates mm -hmm. eventually wear and tear on the energy management system of the body yep. and all these kinds of disorders so i think that's an yep. important point to make as well yeah uh, yeah couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what happens. And so the key is just to get the light whenever you can get it. Really, it's it's wild to think that that's, that's the foundation. Light like that is the foundation for hormone balance, for mitochondrial health, for um, optimum circadian function. Just, just, just go outside. Right. <laughs> just go outside. Right. And like, here's, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, like, my outside, in an ideal world, my outside is during the UVA rise. Yes. When UVA light first appears, um, in, in an ideal world, I'm getting a walk then. A 20-minute walk, like, listen, for the first time in a long time, I got a 90-minute walk Ooh. in that window. I know, right? Knock on wood, that happens again sometime. Um, but like, that's a key time for me. But the, the thing is, is like, that's, it's, that's not, that's not what happens right. all the time. Right. Sometimes, my, sometimes my art, my natural light exposure is in a car with the sunroof open. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's with just windows, looking through windows or opening the front door and looking like that weirdo in my neighborhood. When I step outside and I just kind of stare up at the sky and sometimes people walk by and they're just, they kind of, <laughs> what are we looking at? You know? um, so just do the best you can. Can. And, and that, that's what I want to encourage you. It's not about being perfect. It's about being consistent. And so just do the best you can. But if you do have time to prioritize some time, that morning UVA light, I have found clinically to be potent. I don't know about you and working oh, yeah. with, you know, the, all the people that you've worked with. That one. It, it does so. So it, it signals so many pathways in the brain and in the body that I just think that that's the time of day that I really ask clients to prioritize. So if I get the question, which is a frequently asked question, and my lovely marketing uh, uh, woman is having me do a frequently asked questions guide, so be, stay it. tuned. But the, the question becomes, what would you prioritize? Sunrise versus UVA. And I would always say, if you have a bigger chunk of time, spend it outside during that UVA light, which I also think is more attainable for a lot of people who have a hard time waking up um, early, even at sunrise. So it gives people hope that it's not just about you have to get out at sunrise or else you're screwed for the rest of the day. Right. Do the best you can to get a hit of sunrise and then go outside in, the, in that early morning UVA light if you can, that morning UVA light, and you see a lot of benefit. Yeah, and people are saying, oh, can I, can I look time. through a window? And yeah, windows are going to usually block a lot of those beneficial light rays, either all of them or part of them. And what we're looking for is that natural signal to sync up with your eyes that will sync up with those organs. And that's what's the most important thing. And the time is going to be different depending on the time of year, depending on where you live. Yeah. So the Circadian Life app is the one. I know you've got that one in your bio. I use DMinder because... I look at, I'm like, all right, sun is between zero and 10 degrees, sunrise, sun yeah. is between 10 and so, 30, that's UVA, yeah. like, Let's give people those, let's give people those metrics so that they know, right? They have, so the, the, a lot of these, the, the way that these lights, these colors from the sun come to us in our, our specific geographical location right. depends on how high the sun gets yeah. above the horizon. And so, for example, I will never have vitamin D, a vitamin D opportunity right now mm -hmm. because that requires UVB light. And where I live, in order for UVB light to penetrate from the sun, because the sun has it all, right? But it's, it's, it's location compared to my location, given a time of year, that will determine what light frequencies come to me. The sun never gets above 30 degrees. And so if it doesn't get 30, above 30 degrees in the middle of winter, I will never get UVB light. So if you have the D-Minder app, you look and you'll see, you can open the app and you see in your location where, what degree, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what the degrees that the sun is. And you can kind of track the sun across this arc. 
in the app. So look and note in any given time, if it's after 30 degrees, that is a UVB window. If it's between 10 degrees and 30 degrees, that's when UVA starts. And so, and it's not like it's just UVA and then UVB, they layer right. on each other up until solar noon and then they start to go away in a very sim in the same order that they, they they appeared and so you can also get the circadian life app again i do have a link in my bio you could go to their instagram page um and what they do with the circadian app is you can go ahead and click on the dashboard you put in your location just like you would with dminder you click on the dashboard and on the dashboard there's a little arrow uh, next to uva uvb and it'll say uva rise for me, it was 922 this morning. So at 922, UVA appeared, and, and it'll tell me if there was a UVB rise. It'll tell me when UVA goes away, UVB goes away, sunrise, sunset. I really, uh, Bastion did a really cool job with that app to kind of give people those metrics. But yeah, that's how you could do it. If the sun's above 10 degrees, between 10 and 30 degrees, that is your UVA morning window, yeah. a key time to get outside or have open windows whenever possible. Yeah, and you just and that's usually the first two hours of the day that people should really look at prioritizing. That first two hours of sunlight is really vital, I think, for your hormones, for your thyroid, for all of those things working properly in your body. And uh, yeah, most people aren't going to be able to synthesize vitamin D. There's a lot of vitamin D questions. Most people, I mean, I can't hear in Georgia, even though we have UVB, the UV index doesn't go above five or six. So there's not an opportunity really for me to synthesize a ton of vitamin D. So you really want to prioritize getting it in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, keeping your circadian rhythms intact is going to help you to um, have that enough vitamin D stored in your liver to get through the winter, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we've put a huge emphasis on vitamin D and I would encourage anyone who wants a different view on vitamin D to listen to Sarah's talk with Jim Stevenson. Mm -hmm. He's a citizen researcher who's, who has lived the vitamin D. He like literally has probably read 10,000 vitamin D research articles over the course of the past two decades. What Jim has found and what I also uh, have found, and it just makes sense, so bear with me, is that why would I need to artificially elevate vitamin D all winter long with massive supplementation if it wasn't available in my environment? So what I encourage people to say is that if you actually dive into the literature, number one, they're always measuring the storage form of vitamin right. D. And so, and not necessarily the active form. And, and number two, there are literally a hundred different vitamin D metabolites. So for us to think that we could find a clinical picture on one number is a lot, very antiquated. Like we used to think of thyroid function. I don't know anyone who ever just yeah. had their TSH tested, TSH, yeah. right? And then their doctor said, oh, you're normal. Everything, there's nothing wrong with you. And you're like, but I'm constipated. My hair is falling out. I've got very dry skin, right? You're like, right. I'm depressed. I'm cold all the time. Um, and so you have to recognize that we can't just rely on one number. And so what we're, those of us who live in these geographic locations where vitamin D is not available to us in the form of sunlight exposure, we would have consumed fats or animals or organ meats that would provide us with some vitamin D. And melatonin is kind of on the winter axis. It's the winter support hormone for our anti-inflammatory processes. The average human is trying to live like in, in wintertime is trying to live like it's summer, right? right. We're trying to, to, we're trying to make it 75 and sunny the all whole the time. entire time just yeah. as it all the time but if in the winter we can start to honor the darkness by not flipping on every light in the house so keeping it dim until sunrise dim after sunset we make melatonin earlier in the day and we're, so we're going to have an, an extended period of time of using melatonin when we allow our body to use melatonin in that way like really maximize its production in the winter that takes care of a whole host of inflammatory cascades in the winter so vitamin d really cool anti-inflammatory hormone in the summer melatonin really great anti-inflammatory hormone in the winter if you take advantage of what your circadian rhythm is giving you Right. That's why the imp the importance of circadian rhythms, another importance of circadian rhythms in the winter to help you again, because the more and more cortisol we produce and the more we kind of extend the day and, yep. you know, give ourselves this artificial summer, the more that can actually kind of take out your body's stores of vitamin D. And so I think that that's where a lot of people get into crisis with hormone issues and thyroid issues, especially during the winter. I see those a lot more prevalently 
because people aren't respecting these natural rhythms. And, uh, you know, somebody will answer one more question, but somebody had said, so I can basically cure my adrenal fatigue from by just going outside. I did. I tried everything. I even got a master's degree in clinical nutrition. <laughs> like that's my level of nerdiness because I thought that was the answer. And it, it, I've said this many times on podcasts, it moved the needle a little, yeah. right? But nothing changed my adrenal fatigue uh, or just if it's adrenal fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome, that is one thing. That is one thing that I have so many clients transform fairly quickly, literally after decades of being just uh, ener their energy just tanked with this morning light that we're talking about with blocking the artificial light at night. Yeah. So yeah, this recording will be available. Sarah, I do think we should highlight. Yeah. So we, yes. if, if we're, we're offering two things, right? Because we realize the need for just hormone balance. For those of you who are not interested in working, dealing, or, or are not dealing with infertility or trying to conceive, we're going to offer a, ba a hormone basics from this perspective, really going into the details on this. Um, and so that's going to be a course that, I, that we said is going to be available in yeah. February, the beginning of February. And we're also offering a Zoom live on Monday in case anyone wants to come on and ask questions about these two programs. We can't give a ton of specific medical. We, I can't give medical advice anyways, right. right? But we can't give a ton of specific advice in a short amount of time without knowing your health history. It would be really, really neglig uh, negligent of us to do that. Mm -hmm. But what you can uh, ask us is questions to see if we would be a good fit to work with you through these courses to see if our information and our style and what we've seen in clinical practice would benefit you. So I know, Sarah, do you have the link in your stories or in your bio? Yeah, I've to got sign the link in my that? stories right now. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and pop it into my bio for this weekend. And then mm -hmm. the recording is going to be available on my YouTube channel and my podcast over the weekend. And I'll put that Zoom link also underneath those recordings. If anybody wants to come in and join us on Zoom on Monday at 1230, that will be an option. And yeah, we're having a hormone balancing course for anybody who's like, I don't have, uh, I don't want to get pregnant right now, <laughs> or I'm not a practitioner who works with people who are trying to get pregnant. Um, so we're going to have that course, but then we're also having a fertility course that starts January the 23rd. And we have actually uh, four pregnancies now, Carrie, <laughs> from our last cohort. So. <laughs> Super cool. It's yeah. so cool to see because these, these women were, just, you know, infertility, right? We've gone down that before. So that's just so, so cool to hear. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, we're excited about these new offerings, and uh, this will be available on replay. So just check my bio, YouTube, or podcast, and I'll get those out, and we'll leave it up on the Instagram as well. Anything else, Carrie? No, but if, if I want to encourage anyone to do anything, it's maximize your time outside in the morning whenever yep. you get it don't overthink it just do it and don't let perfect be the enemy of good don't tell yourself like like this morning i woke up to a comment of like well it must be nice that you can blah i'm like honey i have a three-month-old right now so don't tell me it must be nice i know i know i know <laughs> we i know we, I, I know. Do our best. we do our best and and we will help you if you have, if you're in a tough situation, even if we, we work with shift workers, right? We, yeah. we all always, so we will help you do the best that you can do given your situation. Yeah. I've had three nurses within the last month that they just took my courses. They didn't do a bunch of other stuff, but they just took my courses and they're feeling better and improving hormone markers and thyroid markers and all that stuff just from doing some really simple stuff in my exactly. courses. So exactly. it is possible for nurses, doctors, shift workers, all these people to get improvements. Absolutely. It's not impossible. Yep. So yeah, totally. Yay. Okay. I'm so excited. I would love, I can't wait to see whoever wants to join that zoom on Monday and anyone wants to join these courses. I just love sharing this information. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.